الحمد لله حمد كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه وصلوات الله وسلامه على نبينا الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى من تمسك بسنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Today, inshallah, as we gel between Maghrib and Sham, going to deal with this issue of innovation. And it is a really important issue. We can't speak enough about it. The Muslim, as he is living and he is existing, he can never, ever give enough advice to people who are around him, those who he knows and those who he doesn't know concerning the evil and the danger of innovation. Similar to At-Tawheed and the correct Aqeedah. Never waver and never allow yourself to be told by people you talk about At-Tawheed too much. Never allow that to happen. Because if it was enough for the prophets and the messengers Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim to talk about Tawheed the way they did and if it was enough for Allah Azza wa to send down the Quran and the other books with the message of a Tawheed the way he did, then you and I as human beings should never get enough of placing emphasis on the issue. And innovation is the same way. For those of you who are trying to be students and people on the Sunnah and of the Sunnah, don't let people come and say to you, when are you going to stop warning about innovation? Inshallah, the answer should be never because it is an unending mushkil that needs to be addressed. So when we talk about innovation here, this small quick class is not enough. It's your obligation to learn the fiqh of innovation and what's connected to it. I can't possibly do everything that should be dealt with today. Can the one who is a mubtadi, an innovator, can he make toba? That issue should be discussed and explained in details. Do we sit with people of innovation? And if we don't, then when is that? And when we do, or we could, when is that? There are many issues. The one who has fallen into innovation, can he make toba? We can't get into all of those issues. But I will say to you, everybody, men and women, you want to be a serious student, then you have to get fiqh in as many aspects of this religion as possible, and this is one of the main ones. Someone has a WhatsApp profile in which he has the statement of Sheikh Al Islam Abdul Aziz bin Baz, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, where he said, We're living in the era now, and it is the era of a Rahma and gentleness and ease on the community because there's widespread ignorance amongst the Muslims. So as a result of that, if you want to deal with the community in a way where you're going to make people understand and practice the religion better, you have to be easy and take it easy. Someone had that from those people I'm in contact with. And that statement of his should be everybody's what's up profile for a day or two. Especially people who are giving da'wah a lot. We're living in an era where knowledge is a little. Where almost every masjid has fallen into innovation. I won't say almost. I will say, wallahu alam. I don't know any masjid on the face of the earth that doesn't have innovation in it. That I know of. Mecca, Medina, Beit al -Maktis, This masjid has innovation in it. The mihrab, the way it is, and an innovation. Doing the adhan at the mimbar is an innovation. In the month of Ramadan, when we give talks every single night in Ramadan after so many rakat, innovation. There are so many issues. People praying in the rows and having girls, 10, 11, 6, 5, 4, standing in the rows with us. Innovation. Many innovations. There's no masjid in Birmingham without innovation. No masjid, not one. 
The message that claims they are the real Salafi people, innovations of Hizbiya, innovation of testing people with this sheikh and that sheikh. What's your position about this issue and that? It those innovations. It is an innovation for the Muslims to say to the Muslims on the day of the Eid, you can come and have the Eid with us where you're going to eat after the Salat. We're going to have a picnic, a party. You could come, but don't bring anyone who's not Salafi. That's innovation you're talking about. So my point is, with innovations being so widespread, it's an issue that everybody here will spend this time well to learn about this issue correctly. And it shouldn't be from the very first things that we engage ourselves in. There are other things that are more important. Other things are more important. But this fiqh of bid'ah cannot pass a person by. And from the fiqh of al-bid'ah, something I have to mention right now very quickly because as I talk, inshallah, I don't want anyone to misunderstand what I was saying. And that is, one of the principles that you have to hold on to when it comes to talking about innovation and shirk is every person that falls into innovation, he's not considered to be an innovator because he fell into innovation. Every person who fell into shirk, that he did something that shirk, you don't say he's a mushrik because he fell into that. Some of the companions of the Prophet wasallam fell into shirk Radiallahu anhum, and the Prophet addressed that issue, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, swearing by other than Allah, saying that it rained because of this star, that star, saying Masha Allah and Masha as Muhammad wanted. Those are aspects of kufr that some of the companions fell into. When the Prophet found out about it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he addressed it, said, Don't say that, don't say this, don't say that. Allah would rescind Jibreel to tell the prophet, some of my servants woke up today as believers and some woke up making shirk as mushrikeen. And I remember when I mentioned this a while ago, that some of the companions fell into innovation and the prophet wasallam addressed it. Like in the incident when they were fighting and they said amongst themselves, let's castrate ourselves. Let's castrate ourselves so we can be focused on Allah. And Allah revealed the ayat, Ya ayyuladina amanu, la tuharrimu tayyibati ma ahallallahu lakum. Oh, you who believe, don't make haram, haram the good things that Allah made halal for you. Companions were doing things like praying and standing up and supporting themselves with ropes, standing up in the sun. They fell into those acts of innovation the Prophet corrected. I remember I mentioned that to make the point. Not everyone who falls into an innovation is an innovator. And I use that as an example. And the people who look for every mistake that you can possibly make, they went and said, Abu Usam is saying that the companions are mubtadi'ah. The companions fell into shirk. And shirk is greater than innovation. What's wrong with you? So this principle, you have to keep that in your mind for the duration of the talk. I said this masjid has innovations, and I'm not here to tell you all innovations of the masjid. It's my job, your job, to give advice. We advise each other. People want to do it, they don't want to do it, we can't help that. But when I say this is an innovation that you know someone has fallen into, I'm not saying the person is a muqtadir. Why is it necessary for this kind of lesson before we get in it? Before we get into it. The other day, this masjid had a guest, an honored guest, insha'Allah. And that was none other than the Shaykh Abdurrahman as sudais Hafidhullah, wa abqahullahu ta'ala lana. He's the Imam of the Muslims. He's the Imam in the biggest, grandest masjid on the face of the earth. That has some meaning to it. I'm not going to say he's like the Pope of the Catholics, but... The Pope of the Catholics, if he comes to any country and he goes to meet the Amma Tanas, that doesn't happen where he goes to meet the regular people in their churches because their religion is like that, hierarchy, hierarchy. Here we have the great masjids, imam, coming to a regular masjid. So that means something. We know there's going to be security detail. We know that a lot of people are going to come. There's no problem with that. So the people get upset. Sour grapes, people always looking to criticize everything. Don't be like that. 
Don't be an old grumpy man. A lot of people come to the masjid. It's not even Ramadan. Why they don't come every night? Relax. People have respect. That's the imam of the Muslims. We can understand that. I don't have any issue with that. What I have a quarrel with is the way our community acted in this masjid. Mostly everybody. You can see on the camera. On the camera that catches us. Mostly everybody in this area remains standing waiting for him. For about 15 to 20 minutes because the salat didn't start on time. And that standing is haram in Al Islam. It shouldn't be done. The Prophet وسلم, told his companions when it was collected by the Imam Muslim, he said, If the iqama is made, if it's time for the iqama, then don't stand up until you see me coming out. So to stand up and to wait for any imam, and he didn't come out yet, Rasulullah said, don't do that. And why did he say? Why did he say that? He said that because he took every opportunity, every chance that presented itself to kill al-ghulu and going overboard. He used to take every opportunity to kill that. Where people were raising him up too high. Anything that led to that, he would stop it. He would say something about it. Just a regular person comes in, or when the prophet would come in, if someone would stand up, he said, don't do that. And he gave us in our religion, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Man ahabba an yatamathil al-nas lahu qiyaman fal yatabawak maqaduhu min al-nar. Anyone who loves and expects and wants someone to stand up for him when he comes in, then let him prepare his place in the hellfire. You're going to go to the knot of Jahannam because that's a sign of kibr that you think people have to stand up. So he wouldn't do it. And Abdullah ibn Abbasin, Ridwan Allahi alayhi, he said, Ma kana ahadun ahab ilayna min Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one was more beloved to us, the companions, than Rasulullah. We loved him more than everybody and anyone else. But we would not stand up for him when he came in because we knew that he hated that. So nobody deserves, nobody deserves that we stand up for them except when it's permissible. Like the guest comes to the house and you go and you stand up for him, you bring him in the house. No problem. But just to stand up like that, there's fiqh in this issue. The point is, all of the people, most of them stood up for 15, 20 minutes waiting for him. That's an innovation. It's not from our religion. That's jahlun. And then as he started getting close, all of the smartphones came out. It was as if the people didn't know who is Akbar and who is A'zam. Who is the Khaliq and who is the Makhluq. And this celebrity culture that we're in right now, this celebrity culture, it is a problem. It's a direct result of lack of understanding of a Tawheed. If people understood Tawheed, They'll know how to love the Prophet correctly, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If people knew at Tawheed who Allah is, who he isn't, what he does, what he, what he doesn't do, people would know how to respect people in the correct way, the legislated way. He comes out and he prays two rakat because he's traveling. After his two rakat, he gets up to talk and people are walking in front of the people in the first row. Allah has more rights for people to just to have sakin and relax. That sheikh doesn't have that right to disturb the people in the first row. Ummat al-Islam. The sheikh doesn't have that right. That we're going to compromise the salat of people for a human being. This is that celebrity culture that we're in. People who claim that they're on the sunnah, this is how we also fall into this stuff. My sheikh, my sheikh. What's the delil for that? The sheikh said, the sheikh said, it's amazing the time that we're living in. People claiming we're Ahlul Hadith, Salafi, and this and that. And we're the first people with this ghulu in individuals. Riya shirkum billahi. So the point here, Ikhwani, is I understand and I take into consideration many people came to our masjid, came to this masjid, who are not from this masjid, and we're not responsible for how they behave. But I saw many people from our community who didn't say anything. You remember the other day I told you last week 
We need a group of you people, you students, you brothers, to be responsible for this salat. You know, this masjid shouldn't be a masjid where people just come and they break their fast and they leave. People come and they pray Juma and they leave. People come and they go to the hamamat, akramakumullah, they do what they have to do and they leave. There shouldn't be a masjid where people walk through the parking lot, the car park, just to access Morrison's. It should be a masjid where there are some people, they are the core members of this masjid, the core members. So what happens is, they don't have hizbi and asabiya, but this masjid, it has his hurma, he's going to protect the masjid. Can you imagine someone just sits over there in the corner, and while we're talking and while we're sitting, they start pray, playing music. African music, Indian music, Arab music. The one who doesn't feel the masjid belongs to him, he'll just leave it and say, that ain't my business, ain't my masjid. But the one who feels this is my masjid, I'm responsible. He has to go and say, hey, what, what, what are you doing? In a nice way, in a way that's appropriate. So my point here, ikhwani fillahi. These masjid in this city, this city, some of the people attend those masjids, they say, this is my local masjid. And they have a ghira for the masjid. And that's from Islam. That's from Islam. We're the people in this masjid who are going to have some ghira. Have the heart to stand up and say, hey, what are you people doing? 15 minutes? You could be praying sunnah prayers. You could be making the dhikr. You could be doing this. You could be doing that. But no, we're into that celebrity worship. That's an innovation. So this issue of studying about innovation in this deen, it's a critical issue, but don't go overboard. Study it like you study everything else with fiqh, with al itidal being in the middle and being balanced. So very quickly, and we have quite a few things to deal with with only 30 minutes to finish, inshallah. And in scratching the top of the surface, we say, what is the innovation? What is the innovation? very easily and very quickly and very gently. Innovation is simply an individual trying to get close to Allah, worshiping Allah in a way that there's no delil for it. There's no proof. Allah didn't reveal any proof for him or her to do that particular thing of what they're doing, whether it's in ibadah, worship, whether it's in aqidah, what he believes. If it's in the deen, in the deen, he has to have a clear delil. That's innovation. The scholars give different interpretations, but they all come to that point. Worshiping Allah in a way that he didn't reveal permission for a person to do that particular thing. And concerning the innovation, from this explanation, there are two types of innovation we have to understand and make a distinction. The first type of innovation is what's called the bid'a al haqiqiya the real, real innovation has no proof connected to it whatsoever like like castrating yourself there's no delil for that to castrate yourself i mean there are many things like the maulid of the nebi there's no delil for that not from close not from far like cursing the companions there's no delil for that like like shedding the blood of the muslims making takfir wholesale takfir just like that so there are many types of innovation, like the Muslim groups. This in Khwani, that one is Salafi. Salafi meaning a group, a group. You have to be with our group and everything we say, you better not go out of that group. All of that stuff, Sufi, all of that, innovation. If someone says that a person has to have a madhab, that's an innovation. Abu Bakr and Uthman Ali, Ridwan Allah Ali, didn't have any madhab. Those innovations, and there are many, they have no delil for them. No delil. Absolutely none. And when people use any delil to try to prove this, they're taking the delil out of context. They're not using a delil that the companions used to prove those points. The second type of innovation is called the innovation or the bid'a al idafiya with the da al idafiya That is the innovation that, from one angle, there's a proof for it. But from another angle, the way it's being done, it's no proof. For an example, a dhikr. There's dhikr in Islam. There are delil for dhikr. 
But then the person comes and he says, huwa, 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 Allah, Allah, Allah. There's no delil for that. So he'll come and he'll use a, a, an ayat, a hadith about dhikr to prove that. No. You can't do that. You can't do that. So there are many issues. Fasting, for an example. We fast in this religion. But this individual, he wants to go on a hunger strike. He wants to fast continuously in order to make a point, a political point, or in order to protest. No, nope, that's an innovation. So these two types of innovation as it relates to the taklif of al-bidah, you have to understand that. Pure innovation and an innovation that it has a point to it, but it's being done the wrong way. Secondly, secondly, there is an innovation that takes you outside of the religion. And then there's the innovation that doesn't take you outside of the religion. The innovation that takes you outside of the religion, they call it the bid'ah al-mukaffirah. The bid'ah, the innovation that you'll become a kafir if you were to do that particular thing. And there are many, there are many. I mean, there are many, many. Like I told you, when you have a ghulu in an individual to the degree where you say, this particular sheikh, he is ma'asum. Even if you don't believe he's ma'asum in the whole religion, you say he's ma'asum in the minhaj. That's takdeeb to the kitab and the sunnah. That ghulu is a bid'ah mukaffira. People of the sunnah fall into that. The sheikh is ma'asum in this issue or that issue. No one is ma'asum except the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And then you have these innovations that they don't take you outside of the religion. Like having this mimbar or this mihrab, this mihrab, doing the adhan at the mimbar. These things don't take you outside of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As it relates to this issue of innovation, khwani, the Quran and the Sunnah put a lot of emphasis on the danger of it and exposing it and warning the people of it. Very quickly, Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Ruhbaniyatin ibtadu'uha, ma katabnaha alayhim. He told us about the people of the past who used to go overboard and trying to get close to Allah by not getting married, by living in the monastery, by living in the church. Allah said it was an innovation that they invented for themselves. We didn't legislate this thing for them. Ahlul Kitab made it up. He said in the Quran, Everything the Prophet gave you, take it what he told you to leave alone, abandon it. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he told us, leave innovation alone. Too many ahadith. The hadith of the hawd, yawm al qiyamah, when the Prophet comes to his hawd, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, his fountain, and people want to drink from that fountain, the malaika will prevent people from coming to drink. And the Prophet would try to get involved in order to get them to drink, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The malaika would say, no, you don't know what they invented after you. La tadri ma ahdathu min ba'dik. You don't know what these people, your followers invented, introduced in the religion after you. So the Prophet is going to say, get away, get away. You can't drink, you can't drink. Because that stuff you're doing, that stuff you believe in, so that's him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, warning us. Many ahadith. Anyone who introduces in this affair of ours, this religion, what's not from it, it will be rejected. Anyone who does an action in this affair of ours, this religion, and it will be rejected. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la'anallah, men awa muhditha. May Allah curse the individual that gives protection to a mubtadi. Why did he say la'an Allah? They call that in Islam and in Arabic a tarheeb, a zajr. When someone hears Allah's prophet curse the person who did this or that, he says, I don't want to be that person. So he said, may Allah curse the one who gives protection to a mubtadi. Gives him protection. What does it mean? It could mean this guy, he's supposed to go because he did some crime. The leader has to get him, but you give him refuge and safety and security. Look at our religion. Look at our ummah. Look at our ummah today. Our ummah today. There are certain personalities who are living right now, like the one connected to ISIS. He's supposed to be the Khalifa. Certain personalities that have died 
in the recent years who are doing things that are not from the religion in terms of killing people indiscriminately. If you were to mention their names, if you were to refute one of them, if you refuted his action, his statement, his written, what he wrote, and you refuted it with knowledge, and you refuted it with justice, many of our ummah will be against you. They will be against you because of the celebrity thing that we have. It's the personality. It's not what the person is saying or doing. It's not Allah said this and the prophet said it and that person is doing it the right way. If you were to speak about some of these people we're attached to, people will say, you work for the government. You are kafir. You are munafiq. You are a spy. And the prophet told us the hadith I just told you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah curse the one who gives protection to a muhtith, a mubtadir. This is not a joke. It's a serious issue. Look at anywhere on the internet, YouTube, where someone refutes someone who is a clear innovator, clear khawarij, from the khawarij, clear as the sun in the sky. But you'll find the comments, they are not just in support of the innovator, but you'll find the Muslims in the Shabbat using foul language, F you and F your mother and this and to that degree we go overboard in defending this stuff. That's our ummah today. And that's what Abdullah ibn Mas'ul was speaking about. May Allah be pleased with him. When he told the tabi'een, كَيْفَ أَنْتُمْ إِذَا لَبِسَتْكُمْ fitnatun. How is the time going to be when the fitna, it envelops you? If someone leaves off an innovation during that time, the people are going to say, the sunnah has been abandoned. The sunnah has been abandoned. This person is a mujahid. The sunnah has been abandoned. So the point here is, these ahadith, ikhwani, they go to show that the Nabi of Al-Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, he addressed these issues. He brought a religion that addressed this issue. Just as shirk is serious, innovation is serious in the religion. Falling into it, not doing anything about it, it being present, we should look at it like it's the plague and I don't want it coming to me. I don't want it being close to me. After that, ikhwani, we come to the issue of some of the dangers of innovation. And there are many. We'll just mention three right here, inshallah. One of the most serious dangers of falling into innovation is that a person is making al-istidraq al Allah. Al-istidraq. As if Allah forgot something. Hashir Allah wa a'udhu billah. Allah forgot something. And this person or these people they have to come and add this thing that they're doing because Allah forgot it. Like the Yahud and the Nasara. The Yahud and the Nasara, they're always updating their religion. Always updating. After this month, we're going to choose some new prophets and they'll choose you as a prophet. So you become a prophet. And then after three more months, so more people become prophets. Making halal, haram, halal, haram, halal. That's how they... Our religion is not like that. Our religion is tawqifiyya. It's not for any Bakr, Amr, Zaid to come and to tamper with this religion. No matter who you are. You can't do that. So the person is making istitraq on Allah. Look what some of the set of this ummah said concerning this issue. Al-Imam Malik, one of the greatest ulama of Al-Islam, who's not ma'asum. And you don't have to follow him. There's no dalil that you have to be on his madhab because you come from West Africa or you're from Sudan. So you have to be Maliki. That's a, that's a bid'ah. People say it without any hesitation and without any shyness. You must take one of the four imams and be on one of those madhabs. Anyway, we respect all of them. And if you want to follow that madhab or any of the other ones, it's okay. Just... When you find that the madhab is wrong, take the haq and leave the mistake of the imam or the mistake found in the madhab. Al-Imam Malik, he said, Men, men ibtada'a fi deeni Allahi ta'ala yaraha hasana faqad ittahama muhammadan bi'annu khana risala. Lana Allah ta'ala qala al-yawm akmaltu lakum deenakum. 
anyone who introduces in this religion an innovation and he believes that thing that he did is a good thing he has accused Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam of being untrustworthy and not relaying the message because Allah said in this religion said in the Quran today I have completed for you your religion lakum dinukum. our deen is finished as a reaver Abu Sam I'm a reaver I come into this religion in 1986 I can't bring a single thing to this religion I can't bring anything in this religion nothing for as long as I live I can't bring anything in this religion of Islam I don't add anything. If anything, I can enhance something like I painted the masjid. Like I gave some money and we were responsible for getting new fans. Something like that. You can enhance something that's already here. But you can't bring anything new. No one can do that. No one. No one has the right. Revert or not a revert. Any and everybody is born. You're born into this religion and it is a privilege, a gift given unto you. And it's not for you to do anything with it, to tamper with it. Because Allah completed this religion. As for Judaism, you can tamper with that religion. And they do. Christianity, you can tamper with it. They make up holidays for themselves. No problem. They make up holidays left, right, and center. New ideas, left, right, and center. They flip back and forth. Depending upon what day it is and how the wind blows. Islam is not like that. Our mother Aisha. Our mother Aisha. From the Salaf and from the ulama of the Salaf. Radiallahu anha. She said about the ayat of the Quran. Ya ayyuhar rasul. Ballig ma unzila ilayka. Wa in lam taf'al fa ma ballakta risalata rabbik. O rasul Allah said. O you rasul. Relay the message that I have revealed to you. Relay it to the people. And if you don't relay it, if you don't do so, you haven't done what you were told to do. Aisha said, anyone who thinks that they can bring some innovation to the religion, they are accusing the Prophet wasallam of not practicing this ayat. That Allah wasted his time revealing that ayat. So that's one of the serious dangers of innovation. Anybody who wants to do the molit, anybody, don't say to the person who says to you, don't do the molit, don't say you don't love Rasulullah, don't say that. What that person is saying to you is, hey, Abdullah, where does that come from? Don't do it. This is a dangerous thing. You are saying that Allah forgot something, and you, you, the genius, you're coming with something to remind Allah. He said that he completed everything in his religion, but you're saying, no, no, there's one thing that was forgotten. And that's the mawlid. وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا Allah completed this religion. That's danger. Number two. The one who innovates or the people who do these innovations and they accommodate them, these people are in competition with Allah Azza wa Jalla. Not only are they in competition with Allah, but they're like shuraka. They're like shuraka. Shuraka, a sharik. And Allah, la sharika lahu. Allah alone deserves to be worshipped. He created me by himself. He didn't tell Muhammad to help him, Jibreel, the angel, that anyone and anything who has something to do with that process, it was all because Allah chose all of that. So therefore, I have to single him out for worship. Once I start including other people in that process, I'm making shik billah, my mother and my father they figured prominently into my creation. So as a result of that and because of that, no one can deny that they had a lot to do with me being born, me being here. So because of that, as a Muslim, I'm going to bend the rules because I got to obey my mother and my father because they helped me to be born. That's shirkum billahi. I have to put my mother and my father below, below what Allah Ta'ala ordered here and there he said in the quran about the people of Quraysh and other than the people of Quraysh, people who legislate do they have partners who have legislated in the religion legislated things that allah didn't give any permission to have it legislated for 
So when people do this innovation, whatever it is, that individual is in competition with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lastly, Ikhwani, what we want to mention concerning this, and a lot could be mentioned about that. There were some people during the time of the Prophet who used to also say that revelation came to them. Allah revealed a number of ayat for different people. Woman أَظْلَمُ مِنَ افْتَرَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا Who is the worst in lying? Who's the worst than the one when it comes to lying? The one who says that uh, he lies on Allah. And he says what? He says, Allah revealed to me. And Allah didn't reveal to him anything. Or he says, I'm going to reveal similar to what Allah revealed. Allah called those people liars. And the person trying to innovate in the religion. As if he can reveal in the religion what Allah didn't reveal. The last issue we want to mention is people of innovation. They're the people who are the most astray out of the creation. There are a lot of people who are astray on different levels. But the mubtadi'a, the mubtadi, when it comes to being on dalala, they're the ones who are more astray than anyone. And that's why when we make Surah Al-Fatiha, we ask Allah to keep us away from the dalin. Who are the dalin? They're the Christians who have no knowledge and they work based upon ignorance. The Yahud. Allah is maghdubi alihim. Allah is angry with them. Why? Because they have knowledge. They had a lot of prophets. They had a lot of messengers. The message of Tawheed is still with them for the most part. So they have knowledge, but they don't work by it. Whereas the Christians, they have no knowledge. No knowledge. And they work based upon no knowledge. As a result of that, they were called Balin. The innovator is like the Christian. He's on Dalala. The ayat of the Quran said, وَمَنْ أَضَلُّ مِنْ مَنْ Who is more astray than the one اِتَّبَى هَوَاهُ بِغَيْرِ هُدًا مِنَ اللَّهِ He followed his desires without no guidance from Allah. Who's more astray than that? He does things without no knowledge. He doesn't know what he's doing. If you ask him, where does that dhikr come from? He'll get upset for the question. If they're sitting and the dhikr comes and they stand up and you don't stand up because they believe Rasulullah came into the room at that time. If you don't stand up, those people will do some craziness to you. Innovation. One of the dangers of it, they are the most astray of the people. Very quickly, Akhwani, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, another thing we should understand about innovation, the sunnah, it unites the people. And innovation, it divides the people. The sunnah is a unifier. Innovation is a key that scatters things apart. In the Quran, he mentioned, This is my path. This is my sunnah. So follow it. Follow that sunnah. Follow that way. And do not follow, don't follow those other divergent paths. The paths of innovation. He said, those of you who live a long time, you're going to see a lot of ikhtilaf, people doing this, people doing that. He said, take my sunnah. Take my sunnah. And the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa. Hold on to it. That's why it's called Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. People of the sunnah, and they're with the group. So if you find a group of people claiming to be Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah, and they're dividing themselves unnecessarily, know that they're on some innovation. It's innovation. Because the sunnah brings people together, like what happened with the Prophet Wasallam, His companions from Mecca and Medina, and Muhajireen and the Ansar, they came together. The Arabs and the non-Arabs, they came together. The elders and the youngsters, they came together. Men and the women, they came together. They all came together. You didn't find them dividing themselves. Whereas innovation, like an asabiyah, you know, being having asabiya, being crazy and fanatical about a position or a person, that causes you to be divided. Innovation is a problem. Third thing, innovation, ikhwani, is like the sister to shirk. 
If a person opens up innovation on himself, suran suran, that he also will be a person who will accommodate shirkun billahi. It's like the sister, the cousin, the relative of a shirk. You're not going to find a person just doing an innovation and shirk is not somewhere there in the equation. Some type of shirk. And that's because a shaitan, he knows that this is one of the best ways to get the people because the person is going to make toba to Allah from some of the sins and the mistakes that he makes, but he's not going to make toba from an innovation that he's making because he actually thinks that he is getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The proof of that that the ulama of Islam uses the statement of Allah. قُلْ إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ رَبِّيَ الْفَوَاحِشْ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ وَالْإِثْمْ وَالْبَغِي بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ وَأَنْ تُشْرِكُوا بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ السُّلْطَانَ Tell them, Ya Muhammad, if you want to know what my Lord has made haram, He made haram that you should do any fawahish, whether it's open, whether it's hidden. He made haram that you should oppress people you should do crimes and sins and oppress people without justice. And the last part, that you make shit with Allah without knowledge. Shit with Allah without knowledge. He put that together. Shirk, innovation is no knowledge because people are doing things they can't prove it. They only can prove it with qiyas, that's batil. They only can prove it with it makes sense in their hawa. Now in closing, the last issue we want to mention, some of the reasons why we have these innovations, and there are many. At the top of the list, Ikhwani, ignorance is really an important and integral reason that people fall into innovation, and usually from this ignorance, it's going to stem from there. But one of the main factors that lead to innovation is weak hadith, weak and fabricated hadith that cause people to do things. People want to get close to Allah and they're sincere and they want to get rewarded. So they read these weak ahadith and they believe in them. Like this issue in Al-Islam, there's ikhtilaf. What was created first? There's a hadith that says the pen was created first. So some scholars said the pen was the first thing that was created. And there's some proof that show the arsh of Allah was created first. The arsh of Allah. Some people said that. Some people said this. And there's proof for this and there's proof for that. Some people said, tawakkuf, I don't know. Because there's proof for this, proof for that. But I believe in both of them. Let's keep it moving. Then we get a fourth group. The innovators. They come and they say the first thing that Allah created was whatever pleases them. So if he's a person who loves Rasulullah, he says Rasulullah was the first one created. If he loves Ali ibn Abi Talib, there are those people say Ali ibn Abi Talib was the first one who was created. Some people said that the aql, the intellect, was the first thing was created. Because their whole religion is relying upon the intellect. Not the Quran and the Sunnah. They say that the first thing you're responsible for is using your aql. If it doesn't make sense to it, push it away. So they said that this is the first thing that Allah created. Whatever they want. So because of those weak hadith, People do things, believe in things that are not correct. Weak hadith are a problem. So what we have to do is, you don't have to be a scholar in hadith, but you guys in this generation, you millennium babies in this generation, instead of wasting your time falling off a of cliffs looking for this Pokemon stuff, you can use the smartphones and this stuff on the computer to go to places, what are the famous weak hadith? And you can be exposed to many of the weak hadith. Easy. That's the good of the time that we're living right now. That you don't have to necessarily call someone to get a fatwa. Almost everything is right there at your disposal if you know how to look for it. So avoid the weak hadith. Number two. From what causes people to fall into innovation is following the taqaleed and the adat, following your culture and your customs. Following the culture and the customs. And as we mentioned many times, following the culture and the custom is okay in Al-Islam, provided 
the custom, the culture doesn't go against the religion. This is an issue that requires fiqh. When is the culture okay? The culture can actually determine. It can determine. Sometimes. The man want to come and he wants to marry your daughter. And you say, okay, the dowry is 5,000 pounds. You have to pay 5,000 pounds. And also, you have to rent one of these big halls. Three days in the row. He says, hey, hey, the best nikah the prophet said is the one where the dowry is it. He said, I know that. But that's my culture. That's my culture. If you don't do this, everyone from my relatives are going to look down on me. I don't have to look down, be looked down upon for you. They can marry you off. If I want to do that, I can, but I don't have to. In cases like that, the boy who wants to marry that friend, don't go to the imam and say they're oppressing me. Because his culture dictates that to you. It, 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 that can happen. At times where it can happen. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the culture that goes against the religion. The culture of destroying the body, cutting the face and all this stuff that people do to their bodies. We're talking about the culture of oppression. The culture of these things that we do when we get married, all of this stuff like that. That stuff causes people to fall into innovations. You go get married into a new culture. You have to ask them, well, 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 what does this mean? What does that mean? They give you a turban. For an example, you put a turban on. You have to wear a sword. That's okay. No problem. You know, like those Yemeni swords. You look like that, like an Oman. Then they want to put a big flower in the side of your ear. You say, what's this flower for? Oh, that comes from the God tree that gives us good luck over there in that by the ocean. Say, I don't, want, I don't want that big flower in my ear. For what? And some of the Muslims, you have to be like that. You have to say, what is this and what is that? Even what you drink and what you eat. But you have to relax because I did see people go overboard. Some people, when they get married, for an example, they put those flowers around the men. You know what I'm talking about? The necklace. And the guy says, oh, men can't be like women. There's a flower. No, no, no. Relax, relax. That's not men being like women in this case. Those are just nice smells in the celebration. So you can't go overboard. The point is, taqalid, adat. They make people fall into innovation. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَإِلَى الرَّسُولِ قَالُوا بَلْ حَسْبُنَا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا When it is said to them, come, come to Allah, to the Quran, the Sunnah, they say, no, it's enough what we found our fathers doing. That's enough for us. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا When it's said to them, Follow what was revealed by Allah, the Quran, the Sunnah. They say, no, no, no. We're going to follow what we found our fathers doing. So now, you go to where I come from in Africa. You go to where I come from. There are a lot of taqalid that are against the religion. When you want to respect the elders, you have to bend down over to them. You have to make rukur. You may lay on the ground out of respect. They don't think that that shirk. The elder, the man is 80 years old. He's an elder, 80 years old. Even if some leader came from the next town to meet him, you can't touch his hand out of respect of the elder. That's from the religion, respecting the elder like that. That leader doesn't even shake his hand. You can't touch him. He's our elder. Okay, no problem. As for bowing, making sajda and all of that, Bending down. That innovation comes as a result of the culture. But we have to remember, Ikhwani, and giving down with Allah and dealing with these issues, we have to take it easy with people. Because when these things are embedded inside of them, it's not very easy just to get it out of them in one day. So if you're young and you just stop doing things just like that and you're abrasive and obnoxious, the people are going to look at you and they're going to say, you have disrespect and they'll never listen to your dawah. They don't want to listen to it. So take it easy. Last point that we want to mention why people fall into the innovations is because people want to follow the mutashabi hat. Those things that are ambiguous. The things in the religion that are not clear. الْفِتْنَةِ 
Those people who have a disease in their heart, they want to go after those things that are not clear, they're ambiguous. They want to make fitna. They want the explanation of that. So they've fallen into innovation about the qadr. They're trying to find out the details of that. Allah's names and his attributes. And they try to get too deep into that. So it's mutashabi. They start explaining these things away and denying them and rejecting them. Just deal with those things that are clear in the religion and you'll be okay. And leave the things that are from the mutashabi hat that are not very clear. Allah and his messenger knows best, but I believe in it. All of it is from Allah. So in concluding, ikhwani, there are a lot of things that can be dealt with as it relates to the issue of innovation. Don't be of the people who innovate in the religion and don't accommodate innovators in the religion and don't deal with innovators in a bad way altogether because people are on different levels. There's a person who's an innovator and he's ignorant. If given the proofs, he'll change. And then there's the imam of the innovation. And what type of innovation is he doing? Is it the one that's put you out of Islam or not? We have to look at all of these things and it will help to determine how to deal with them. So very quickly for five minutes because we had a complaint. We never ask questions or answer questions anymore. If you brothers have any questions, you can put your questions forward. Before I forget as well, last time I gave a talk, I made a mistake about Umar and I said he was from Beni Makhzum, the student from amongst us, Abdul Hay came and he said, no, Umar was from Beni Adi, and that was correct. And someone else had sent the boy up, my little nephew, they sent him up with a letter and said, you said that this problem that happened with the Munafiqeen was in the battle of Badr, but it was in the battle of Uhud, and we corrected that, but we didn't correct the thing about Umar. So I'm just saying to you, I'm not one of those people who you have to be afraid of correcting. No, you could correct. You could correct. I say this and it's like that. You can always correct that. We're going to make that thing correct, inshallah. And that's why all this stuff is on the internet. So anybody could come and say, that's wrong. As for, I can't get on the internet because I'm afraid of people making muraqab of what I say. I know if some people, they were allowed all of their talks on the internet, you can go after it. Now you can find out what they're saying and show really how incompetent they are. But anyway, you can always correct. Fadli ahi. Now, the brother is asking a very important question. How do you deal with the innovators in the land where the Muslims are weak as opposed to dealing with them in the place where the Muslims are strong? Recently, Zakir Naik, Dr. Zakir Naik, his TV, Peace TV, was taken off of the airwaves because in Bangladesh, someone blew something up about two weeks ago and... The people of innovation in India, they went and told the authorities, the Hindu authorities, that Zakir Naik supports this stuff because of some things that he said that he should not have said when he was talking about being a fundamentalist. He was saying, yeah, I'm a fundamentalist. Everybody should be a fundamentalist. But you can't make those play on words today. You have to be more on top of the thing. Everybody, me, everybody. So the non-Muslims took his thing off of the air. Peace TV off of the air. In India. So, when something like that happens, should we be happy? Should we? No, we shouldn't be happy. First of all, that country is a country where Hindu people are the vast majority. Al-Islam is under threat. They break up messages and destroy messages and kill people and burn people. They do all kinds of things because the Muslims are weak. And as a result of that, the people, the Muslims have to deal with that situation in a way where we're going to try to protect Muslims and Al-Islam, even if there are innovation. We're not happy to see the kawarith and the, uh, the um, disasters and things like that happening to Muslims, whether they're natural or whether they're man-made. We don't want to see that. None of you truly believe so you love for your brother, but you love for yourself. So when Islam is weak, when Islam is in the position of weakness, numbers, ability, 
then we're going to deal with the innovate with the innovator and the innovators accordingly. We're weak. I told you what Ibn Baz said. We're living in a time when it's a time of being gentle and soft because knowledge is a little bit. Knowledge is not a lot. So you deal with people accordingly. And that's what the Prophet did. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. When the non-Muslims used to attack him and his companions and even kill some of the people, he wouldn't get retribution and he wouldn't get revenge because they were weak. He couldn't deal with them like that. But when later on he got power and he got ability, he made them pay for what they did. So during the time of Umar, during the time of Umar, Umar had strength. When Sabir came using these ayat that are mutashabihat, asking about these ayat, Umar had him to come, hit him in his head, and then he said, you get out of Medina for one year. You are abolished. Don't come back for one year. Because Islam was strong. It was really strong. And then during the Khilaf of Ali, during the Khilaf of Ali, there was a lot of drama. Ali was trying to bring the community together. Innovators, more and more and more. People used to say things and do things. Ali didn't do anything to them. He didn't do anything to them. He went. And he sent Ibn Abbas to debate with the Khawarij. Why didn't he deal with him like Umar did? Just wage war and go get him. Because there was instability and strife within his own ranks. Amongst the companions, there's ikhtilaf. These people are riffraff, troublemakers. What did he do? Some of the companions said, they're kuffar, amir al-mu'mineen. Let's fight him, let's kill him. Prophet Muhammad said about these people, Khawarij, these people with Ali. He said that they're the kilab of the Nah, they're kuffar. He said, no. Ikhwanuna, baghu alina. They're our brothers who have oppressed us. And he tried to convince them. And then he ultimately fought them. So when we're weak, <laughs> we deal with the situation accordingly. That's the last question. Atfadda ya akhi, atfadda, Where have you been? I haven't seen you in a long time. You moved to Manchester. Anybody who believes that they are the only people on the Sunnah, they're similar to the Arab Bedouin man who came to the masjid and he urinated in the Prophet's masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the people wanted to get him and the Prophet stopped them from getting him. And he was so impressed with the Prophet protecting him from the people's anger that he made a dua and he said, Oh Allah, oh Allah, have mercy upon me and Muhammad only and don't have mercy upon nobody else. He wanted to exclude the companions. The Prophet said, Ya Arabi, hey Bedouin, you have made something that's why very restricted. Allah's Rahmah is why. Who in his right mind goes around saying we are the only ones? When Allah said in the Quran, "La tazakku an fusakum, huwa a'lamu bimin taqa." Do not praise yourselves. Allah knows best who has taqwa. Al-ladina yutuna ma ato wa qulubhum wajila, annu min Rabbihim rajiun. Those people who do the things that they do and their hearts are trembling and afraid. And they're going to return to their Lord. Aisha say, Ya Rasulullah, is this ayah talking about the Muslims who make mistakes? They drink khamr, they make zina, they steal. And when they do that, a sign of the iman, they are afraid. He said, no, bintu sadiq. The ayah is not talking about that. The ayah is talking about people who pray. People who fast. People who make hajj, give zakat. They do good deeds and they're afraid. They don't know if Allah is going to accept it or not. And here, this one's walking around saying, we are the ones. We are the ones. It's us and no one else. So the seed of hatred is planted in the hearts of people who are on that stuff. So my spin, I don't really like that word. My understanding of the situation is that 
all of these masajid, inshallah, have some good people in it. And it has other than that. And what we need to do is we need to look at the essence of what people are doing and not necessarily what they're saying. Many people hate a serefia because of the behavior of the serefi people, especially the ones who say, we are the ones, rough and tough like that. May Allah protect us from that ghulu and from that ijab and nafs. Prophet Muhammad mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, thalatha min al-muhlikat, three things will destroy you. The first thing he mentioned, ijab al-mar bin nafsihi, a person being impressed with himself. He's actually being impressed. You know, with the clothes even, with the clothes, you get a real nice pair of clothes. I'm talking about real nice, something really nice, some turban or something, and you walk down the street and you'd be like, damn, my stuff is nice. My thing, look at this, this is nice. Prophet Muhammad said, rajulun yamshi fi thobihi. There was a man who was walking like that and he was looking at himself like, man, look at me, I'm really representing, look at my stuff. And he was walking arrogantly in awe of himself. Allah caused the earth to open up and swallowed him. And I'm going to come and say, it's just me and my fruit, just us right here. So 88,000 Muslims praying on the Eid, that don't mean nothing. What we have to do is just come, you know, 700 of us in the tennis court like that. And because we are the ones. Come on, ya akhi. May Allah protect us from that ghulu and that ghurur. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hey,